this session is on its surface, right, about fair use and uh, more especially about the ARL Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for um, academic and research libraries. Um, but the role that this session plays is kind of giving us, and I called it a laboratory, a laboratory to play with this idea about what, what it is to take our daily practices, our, our values, and make policies and do advocacy around those things, right? So we're using fair use and copyright as a kind of um, case study, right? In, at the end of Barbara's talk, um, Emily was asking questions about how do I connect these dots? How do I take my individual practice and connect it to all the many stakeholders that I interact with, et cetera? And copyright, you know, I think is, is a really great um, laboratory for us to ask those questions in because copyright affects so much of what we do in libraries, right? And we affect it in so much of what we do from our course reserves to displays, right? Digital and in-person displays to the preservation of our collections and our archives to course materials in our classes and our faculty colleagues classes to our institutional repositories and on and on and on and on. We deal with copyright and in all of these things and more fair uses at work, right? That it's enabling these important works um, within copyright law, right? Nine times out of 10, it's, it's fair use that lets us do these things, right? But unfortunately, I think in our communities, like in so many others, we're often really reluctant to exercise fair use, right? Because we're uncertain, we're risk averse, we're in these sort of corporate metaphors, right? Where we're, you know, asking question, bottom line questions rather than, um, you know, values questions. So, well, can I get permission? I, I better just spend that money and get the permission and, and mitigate that risk, right? Rather than thinking about what the costs to our values are. Um, and, and we're confused, right? And we're, we're confused not just about what the law is, but about what are even the common practices you know, what is the library down the road doing? I don't even really know that, right? Um, so for the next hour, we're gonna hear from Brandon Butler from um, the Association of Research Libraries about the code of best practices um, in fair use for academic and research libraries, which I will from now on call the code, um, <laughs> so that I don't have to say that again. And which can offer a remedy to that uncertainty, that uncertainty about what other libraries' practices are and about how we can kind of apply fair use um, within our communities um, and by and large be fair. Um, but I'll let Brandon tell you all about that. And uh, just briefly, following Brandon's talk, we're gonna have the opportunity to break into the small groups and uh, talk about the issues that came up in Brandon's talk and connect them to the themes that came up in Barbara's talk. Um, and really talk about how we might advocate around fair use within our institutions and um, more broadly. So with that, I will just go ahead and um, introduce Brandon. Um, Brandon Butler is the Director of Public Policy Initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries, a group of 126 academic and research libraries in North America. He's been at ARL since September 2009, and in that time he's worked on a host of issues ranging from network neutrality to the Patriot Act. In the copyright area, Brandon has performed, uh, has prepared analysis and commentary on the Google Book Settlement, the Georgia State University E-Reserves case, Orphan Works, and a wide range of uh, litigation and legislation. He's a co-facilitator with Peter Yazzie and Patricia Ofterheide, Ofterheide of the ARL Code of Best Practices, which was released in January 2012. Um, he also writes the ARL Policy Notes blog, and you have the URL for that on your Hand out with the chickadee. If you don't have one of these, they're at the back. You can grab one when we go into the um, small groups. And I also have his um, Twitter handle on there. He tweets um, from at ARL Policy. Um, before coming to ARL, Brandon was an associate in the Media and Information Technologies Practice Group at the Washington, D.C. law firm um, Dow Lonis, PLLC, <laughs> where he worked on copyright issues, trademark prosecution, and corporate transactions involving intellectual property. Brandon graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law, where he was an editor of the Journal of Law and Politics. He obtained an MA in philosophy from the University of Texas and did his undergraduate degree at the University of Georgia. And with that, I will turn it over to Brandon.
Great. Uh, thank you all so much. And wow, thank you, Rachel. That was uh, actually one of the coolest um, framing setup uh, uh, talks that I've heard when I've given these talks. Um, I really love the idea that fair use and copyright are a wonderful laboratory for uh, librarians to learn and experiment with their power to advocate for their missions. And this is, I mean, that's exactly what this document that we've been working on uh, for three years or so is all about. It's about bringing the mission and the values of libraries to the fore and, uh, and, and changing that paradigm of permission culture of, of and I like, I like the idea of, of being trapped in a kind of corporate metaphor and remembering and, and returning to instead uh, the nonprofit public spirited mission of libraries and how frankly the law uh, really favors that mission and your fair use rights um, should be very strong for you in this uh, in that regard so uh, you've seen my disembodied head for a while now let's go to my slides and uh, we'll start the show um, so the title right fair use and research librarians and let's go ahead to slide number two uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today and 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 this is actually this talk can run very long and so uh, toward the end, I'm going to kind of speed through some of the details. I really want to focus on the conceptual underpinning here. So I'm going to spend time on copyright and fair use, you know, the big picture, how, how the law works. Uh, then I'm going to talk about this best practices approach, which is um, a, a, an approach to the Copyright Act and to fair use that has evolved just over the last uh, seven or eight years. I'm going to talk about why fair use is important to libraries, and that part I will move through very quickly because I, I think you guys understand why it's important. Then I'll give you a little bit of a taste of what's actually in the code in terms of the principles that are in the, in the document and the values that emerged when we had these conversations. Um, okay, so if you go to slide number three, um, the purpose of copyright. And if I had to ask you right now, uh, and if I were in the room, I might try and pull the room, but um, since it's my disembodied head, I'll just uh, say, if you ask someone on the street, you know, what do you think is the purpose of copyright? Uh, my guess is they're going to say that the purpose of copyright is to, um, you know, protect artists and to ensure that artists have a steady income um, or to, uh, to honor the inherent human rights of um, the Disney Corporation and other very rich corporations are entitled to make money forever from the things that they own that are part of culture. Um, and that's actually a very popular misconception about copyright. Uh, in fact, the folks who make culture, uh, of course, are a key part of um, copyright, and the folks, frankly, more importantly, who own culture and market culture and sell culture are part of that ecosystem. But if we'll go to slide number four, the real purpose of copyright is much broader and more public-minded. It's to promote the creation and, and actually more than just the creation, the kind of functioning of culture, um, including science, including arts. Um, and so it does that right in two ways. Uh, on the one hand, if we'll go to the next slide, number five, copyright does reward creators with a limited monopoly, right, for a, a certain term of years. Uh, if you create a copyrighted work, you have the right to prevent other people from using that work in certain ways, and that right is limited. And that, that brings us to the second part of how copyright law operates. In order to encourage uh, legitimate uh, reuse of existing culture, which is frankly kind of all that our culture is and all that any culture is, is you know sort of repurposing the existing culture, talking about it, bringing it into connection with other parts of culture and so on, there are uh, several limitations in the Copyright Act um, and rights for users in the Copyright Act that encourage those of us in the new, you know, in the current generation to take advantage of the culture that we've handed down from previous generations and from the culture that's being created around us. Um, and so if you actually look, and not that I'd recommend you do this, um, but if you were to look at the Copyright Act, uh, the first uh, six sections um, talk about the different, def well, the first five are kind of definitional and irrelevant. Then there's section 106, which is the rights of the author. They're limited and delineated there. And then section 107 to section 122, and, and maybe beyond, um, 
those are all rights that belong to us, the users and the folks that need culture in order to think and breathe and talk to one another and so on. And so there's really, uh, it's really a misperception to think of copyright as primarily about protecting uh, people who own and sell culture. Um, it's really, it only protects those people so that uh, culture is released and published so that it can become part of the public discussion. If we go to the next slide, there are, slide number six, there are a lot of different rights in the Copyright Act. Um, like, any, like any piece of legislation, uh, it was written by humans, and those humans uh, are, are, are subject to persuasion by people with interests and money. And so, you know, there's little things in the Copyright Act for shipbuilders, little things in the Copyright Act for ham radio operators, and, and there's little things in the Copyright Act for all kinds of people. And there's actually, there's, there's little things in their libraries in Section 108. And so there's all these little, little narrow exceptions that, that benefit different parts of society that were successfully able to ask Congress to give them a particular exception to suit them. But the most important exception in all of the Copyright Act is fair use. It is the sort of overarching exception uh, that really kind of is an umbrella exception that covers uh, a, an open-ended and flexible set of uses um, that are legal, regardless of whether you are um, get authorization, regardless of whether you pay. Even though the material is copyrighted, you can still make copies, you can still distribute, you can do the things that a copyright owner ordinarily gets to control under some circumstances. Right? The fair use uh, fair use uh, statute describes in very broad terms. Um, when you can take advantage of your rights to make use without paying anyone permission. Um, because the language of the law is very broad, uh, fair use can be challenging. But first, I want to highlight a, a kind of the, po the upside of that. So if we go to slide seven. Fair use is a space for. And this is something my colleague, Peter Yadi, uh, he sort of coined this phrase where it out all over the country, see if we can make a t shirt or a mug. But uh, fair use of space for creativity. Yeah, sure. Oh, no. Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, we were on number seven, fair use, a space for creativity. Okay. So that's okay. All that other stuff I was saying probably wasn't that important. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> So fair use is a space for creativity, right? All, all of that was leading up to the fact that uh, fair use is open-ended, right? It can be even uh, quite difficult to know what your fair use rights are. But that's on purpose. Um, and that intentional flexibility creates a space for creativity in at least three ways. So first, it's a space for um, actual users and creators to make new things, right? to try different kinds of new projects um, that might be in tension or apparently in tension with the protections of copyright. So in that sense, it's a space for people to, you know, to invent CRs or to create a search engine. That will you know, by the way, Google copies the entire internet all the time, and they never pay anyone or ask anyone. And they do that in order to facilitate this new tool, a, a web search engine. Uh, all of that is done with fair use. So fair use creates a space for these new and important creative uses. But there's a couple of other ways in which it's a space for creativity. It's a, it's a space for creativity for lawyers. Um, so if you, um, if, if you are, uh, now there are lawyers who will, who will represent you in this situation. If you're, if you're caught speeding, right, and you're going 85 and 45 or a 35, it's pretty clear you're out of luck, right? There's really not a story you can tell 
uh, that's going to get you out of that ticket. Now, there might be one or two stories, and like I say, there are lawyers that will take that case, but speed limits are not meant to be a thing that allows you to work with your lawyer to find a way to comply with the law, right? It's meant to be very simple and you're stuck with it. Fair use is a different situation altogether. Um, fair use lets you uh, collaborate with people like ARL and with the people in your library who know about copyright and to think about ways that something that's never been done before, something that's never been sued about before, might nevertheless be legitimate. And so fair use creates that space for you to work with uh, your rights with legal experts that are supposed to help you. Um, and then the third way that it's a space for creativity is that fair use gives judges a chance to make new law. Uh, and this is uh, something that you may not know if you're not a lawyer, if you go to law school or haven't you know, encountered this before, but, but judges do make law, um, contrary to the sort of Republican talking that judges supposed to. They do it all the time, and it's really fun. It's a U.S. All right. So uh, I was just beating up on Republicans. So the we are in Oregon, right? Come on. Uh -huh. so, and it is libraries. So the um, I shouldn't say that. So <laughs> so judges do get to make law. They do it all the time. It's perfectly fine. And the fair use um, doctrine is actually an area where judges do make law. They are confronted with situations. That that there is no clear legal answer to whether what the you know what whether something should be fair use or not, and the judge gets to factor in an open-ended number of, of things. I mean, there are factors listed. We'll talk about in a second, but a judge is sort of free to consider the equities. You know what we call the equities in the law. You know the story. Are you doing something valuable? What you're doing legitimate? Um, so it's a space for creativity in those ways. So let's go to slide number eight. Now there are, if you if you've ever read about fair use, uh, you've probably been directed to the statute. This, these four statutory factors, um, and these evolve uh, from you know judge-made law over you know about 150 years. Uh, judges were making fair use law without anything in the statute um, for 150 years, just saying you know this looks fair, to us. and they would talk about why. And when Congress decided write fair use into the statute, uh, they tried to find the factors the judge had used and put them in. But those factors are really um, hard to apply. Uh, you know, they're actually notoriously hard to apply. And when the fair use statute was first uh, codified in the 70s, it was actually pretty common for legal experts to say, fair use <laughs> okay, here we go. So, so there's these four factors, right? Um, so the four factors were not very helpful initially. Um, it was actually quite popular for uh, legal academics to, and you know what, I'm going to take out my headphone because I can hear my own echo, but as long as you can hear me, that's fine. Yep. So when the Fair Use Statute first came out, it was actually quite popular for uh, copyright lawyers and fair use experts and, and so on to say, you know, fair use is really not that useful, it's very hard to apply. You know, no one should bother with fair use. Uh, it's just a sort of license to go to court and get sued and try to defend yourself, and good luck with that. And there was a lot of discouragement over fair use in these first early years. Um, and th th there was a lot of uh, 
courts sort of screwing fair use up pretty badly, too. Uh, there was some early case law where courts said things like, well, the only thing that really matters is whether, you know, the right holder lost money. And if the right holder lost money, then that's not fair and you lose. Or the courts would say, well, uh, you know, if something has never been published before, then you can't make a fair use of that thing because that's just crazy. There's an absolute right of publication and there's no fair use. There's a lot of confusion, um, but luckily things sort of really cleared up in the early 90s. So if we'll go to slide number nine, uh, there's been a lot of good news here in the last uh, decade, two decades or so. Um, first, judges have really come to love fair use in these balancing features. Uh, and this is, it, it shouldn't be a mystery why. If you look around, um, copyright has sort of gotten uh, harsher and harsher for the user over the last couple of decades. You know, the term has gotten longer. Uh, the protection has become automatic. You know, it used to be that if you wanted copyright protection, there were certain things you had to do to obtain that protection and to keep it uh, no longer. Uh, now, if I write a poem on a, on a napkin and I throw it in the garbage and you find that napkin uh, and you decide to publish it, and, you know, 68 years after I am dead, my daughter can sue you for that, right? This is a very strange system we're living in right now where lots of things are copyrighted and they're copyrighted for a very long time. Um, and so judges don't like that uh, when they see when when they see that that long strong protection is having an absurd consequence. They take advantage of fair use as a way to counteract that consequence. So judges have come to love balancing features. Um, another important thing about uh, the fair use doctrine is that the Supreme Court has now said uh, twice in two different decisions that uh, fair use is a First Amendment doctrine. It is, it is one of your First Amendment rights. And this is really, uh, really important. Uh, these were otherwise really terrible decisions. It was the Eldred case, which, uh, in which the court basically said Congress can make copyright perpetual. And then the Golan case, in which the court said essentially Congress can, you know, protect anything willy-nilly, even if it's already in the public domain, Congress can pluck it back out and make it copyrighted again. Um, but in the, co in, the, in the course of making these relatively awful decisions, the court said, but don't you worry, users, because there are important limitations to copyright. And in fact, if those limitations did not exist, if you didn't have fair use to protect your right to criticize, to educate, to comment, and so on, then copyright would be inconsistent with the First Amendment. And so fair use is a constitutionally protected right. It is part of your First Amendment rights. And the last good thing that happened is that judges started to understand fair use and to make better sense out of it. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the very early 90s, in fact, in 1990, uh, Judge Pierre Laval, who sits now on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, who was then a district court judge, um, made a rather startling admission. Uh, he said, I've been deciding these fair use cases, and I didn't know what I was doing, and that's alarming to me. <laughs> um, and it was alarming to all of us. Uh, and so uh, Judge Laval wrote an article trying to explain the fair use doctrine and to make sense of those four factors. And uh, Laval's argument has become the kind of uh, leading uh, interpretation of fair use, and it, it really makes sense out of the doctrine and helps courts apply it in a consistent way. It's been endorsed by the Supreme Court, uh, and in the most recent decision of the Hockey Trust uh, case, uh, it, it really was a, a guiding light that helped ensure that Hathi's many uses were uh, considered fair. So let's go to slide number 10. The framework that Judge Laval uh, created uh, asks really two things. It takes those four factors and distills them into um, two key questions. And the first question is, is your use, the thing you're doing with the copyrighted material, transformative? Uh, uh, is it, I'm sorry, we're on uh, slide 10, yeah. So judges ask, is your use transformative? And transformative, and we'll talk about this a little more, it doesn't mean like you drew a mustache on the Mona Lisa. You don't have to literally transform the thing. You don't have to cut it up or remix it or mash it up. Uh, many of the transformation cases that we have don't involve any changes at all to the material. The question is really, are you doing something new with it? 
Uh, are you using it for a new purpose? And are you adding some kind of value to it? Is your new use, uh, you know, are you commenting on it? Are you, uh, are you putting it in, into a context where it suddenly has a different meaning than it used to have and so on? And then the second question is, assuming your purpose is transformative, did you take an amount that was appropriate to your purpose? Um, one example of, of whether you take too much is the recent Harry Potter encyclopedia case. So uh, a, the publisher of the Harry Potter books uh, sued a guy who had written the Harry Potter lexicon, right? And it, it was an encyclopedia that explained, you know, uh, which character is which and what are the different spells and the different creatures. And it, 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 re it represented the world of Harry Potter uh, in the form of an encyclopedia. Um, and, that's, and the judge said, great, so far so good. This is transformative. You're not writing a book that is the Harry Potter sequel, and you're not writing, and you're not translating the book, you know, you're writing a different kind of book that is commenting on and, and providing information about the Harry Potter world, right? So, sounds good, great, you're on the right track. The problem was, he used a lot more of the Harry Potter books than was really, you know, appropriate to a dictionary or, or an encyclopedia. So he took the kind of juiciest uh, passages and tried to find excuses to include more than were necessary to basically explain the different things he was talking about. And so he lost the case on that front. If we go to slide 11, uh, here's the kind of paradigm case of transformation. This is uh, the, the, the image on the left of your screen is an ad for a luxury sandal. I can, I can never remember if it was Gucci or Chanel. Um, but anyway, it's a magazine ad, right, taken by a photographer uh, with the express purpose of selling sandals, right? And the image on the right is a collage artwork by the artist Jeff Koons. And uh, I'm sure Jeff is saying something very important with that piece, and uh, it's so obvious that I won't explain it to you. I leave it to you. I know that you get it. Um, but this, is, uh, this piece, whatever it's saying, is surely not saying buy these sandals, right? Um, and when the fashion photographer sued Jeff Koons, uh, Jeff Koons was able to say, look, I'm doing something radically different. You know, I took your picture, I juxtaposed it with a bunch of other pictures, and I've made a piece of art that is, is radically different from the thing that you did. And uh, so I shouldn't have to pay you, and the judge agreed. Now, that's kind of what you might ordinarily think of as transformative, right? M max mashing something up, cutting it up, making new art. If you go to the next slide, number 12, transforming is not, as I said, it's not just taking something and cutting it and, and editing it. Um, using works in the context of scholarly study can be transformative if those works were not intended for that purpose. And the example I like to think of is, is just take those advertisements, right, that advertisement for a sandal. Let's imagine that Jeff Koons' message is sandal advertisements objectify women by showing their disembodied feet and, you know, making them into just jumbles of body parts. Let's say that I'm a professor of, you know, feminist theory, and I would like to also make that point, but the way I'm going to make it is by teaching a lecture in my class. And I, and I take these images of different advertising uh, images and I put them up on a screen in my classroom. Or better yet, I put them on a website and I say, go look at this website that I've put together. And you can see the way that women, women have been uh, objectified. I think those are, that is just as much a transformative repurposing as making a work of art the way Jeff Koons did. Um, so use of works for teaching, use of works for exhibits, uh, these things can all be transformative. If you go to slide 13, uh, this is a kind of paradigm case of transformation that is not, you know, artistic per se. This is a Google image search. And if you search Google images for library, you get all these images of books, of course. And, uh, and Google never pays any of these people. Like I said before, uh, none of these people see a dime, you know, but Google didn't draw any of these images, right? Google didn't take these photos. So how is it that Google can copy these images and then present them to you uh, on a page without having to ask anyone's permission or pay? Well, it's because what they're doing is providing a service to help you find images that you are looking for, right? And that is not what the original photo was intended for, right? So the people who took these pictures 
we're not thinking. My, my goal in life now with this photo is to help people find photos of libraries. Um, and so Google is doing something new. So let's go to the next slide. So, so one important thing that happened in the last couple of decades is that we've had this move to transformativeness. The other important thing that's happened is that it's been fairly well documented now that judges care what communities of practice are doing. And this is the real hook for you guys when you're thinking about advocacy, right? All of these documents that uh, have been developed around fair use uh, are predicated on this notion that uh, a, a scholar named Michael Madison, he, he looked at all of the fair use case law that had been done uh, from 1840 uh, when the first case came out until uh, 2005 when his article came out. And he found that when judges are doing fair use uh, decision making, they are really interested in the custom and practice of the individual creative, mostly creative in that context, but increasingly now just users, uh, the custom and practice of user communities, right? Uh, especially when those practices are well documented. So judges are anxious to hear from you. They want you to, to tell them, what do you think is fair? What do you think is right? When do you think it's okay to make uses without uh, compensating? Um, so if we'll go to the next slide, number 15. Uh, Peter Yahtzee and Pat Alfterheide in 2005 uh, took these two insights, this turn to transformation, the coherence of the law, together with this idea that judges care and want to hear from you about what you do, and develop these started developing these best practices codes. If you go to slide 16, several communities have done this with great success. The documentary filmmakers were the first, but different scholarly communities, teachers, the folks that make online videos, uh, dance collections, curators, open courseware makers. Um, and the list goes on and on and continues to grow. Um, journalists are working on one right now. And I know that artists are too. If you go to the next slide, this is the documentary filmmakers code on slide 17. This was the very first one that came out. And uh, it was a smashing success uh, insofar as, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, TV programmers who used to refuse to air films unless every single clip in a film was, was had permission, that is, had been paid royalties or otherwise had authorization, once the filmmakers got together, thought deeply about their use, and declared their values in this document, uh, filmmakers were able to go to the folks at TV stations and say, look, my community has talked, we have thought deeply, and th these are our values, and the, the TV stations largely accepted those views. Uh, films got made that would never have gotten made before. Uh, some of you, excuse me, may have seen the, the movie, uh, This Film Has Not Yet Been Rated, uh, which is all about the MPAA uh, film rating system and how it's, you know, more or less worthless and, and politically uh, compromised. Um, that film is just wall-to-wall -wall movie clips. I mean, there's almost nothing original in it. Um, you occasionally see the filmmaker driving from one place to the next or having a very brief encounter uh, with a studio head, but almost all the rest of it is just like, samples of violence and sex and other things from films and him saying, you know, is this an R rating or not? And so that movie would never have been made before this code came out. And the big the big win was that every documentary filmmaker and every every filmmaker and TV show maker has to get an insurance policy that essentially says, you know, if you get sued, we will cover the costs and anything that you uh, are forced to pay. And so, in some sense, the insurance agency acts, as, acts like a kind of miniature judge. You have to prove to the insurance agency that everything you've done is illegal in order for them to insure you. And if you don't get insurance from them, then your films won't be showed in public, right? Because then otherwise the TV station and the theater, everybody gets worried about liability. Well, after this document came out, everyone who insures documentary filmmakers over fair use, uh, they, it used to be that they would not insure claims of fair use because... The, you know, they believed everything they'd heard since the 1980s about, you know, in the 70s about fair use being just a license to go to court and it doesn't protect you. Um, after the code came out, though, uh, the insurers started, uh, started changing their practices, and now every insurance agency will cover fair use. They will not require you to get permission for every clip. So if we go to the next slide, these best practices are not uh, slide 19, that is. The, the, these best practices are not guidelines. And 
guidelines uh, here is kind of a term of art, but you know, if you've ever used, if you've ever looked at the classroom guidelines, for example, the guidelines for photocopying for classroom use, they were written in the 1970s, and they're horrible, right? They ask you to count words. Uh, they they're just they, they're really useless, and uh, and and they were frankly negotiated um, kind of at the point of a gun. Um, no one no one should be taking those uh, guidelines as the gospel anymore. But unfortunately, they they are. And the way those guidelines operate is by shutting down uh, conversations. Right? They just give you a number, ten thousand words, and no more. Um, that's not the way these best practices work. Uh, they give you principles instead of rules, right? They don't say 10 words or 30 words. They ask you to think about what's legitimate and what serves your your legitimate purpose. And they ask you to think about what's appropriate given your goals, right? And that's going to vary from case to case. And so we don't ask you to stop thinking. We try to give you guidance as you think. Um, there are limitations in these guides, but, you know, they're not, they're not banned. You know, we don't, again, we're not pretending to have uh, the word from on high once and all and forever. Um, this just describes the consensus in the community right now around what is fair and legitimate. But, you know, folks are free, and, and over time, I'm sure it will become increasingly necessary um, to think in ways that, that we couldn't anticipate when we had these discussions in the code. And so the code doesn't claim to be the final word. And finally, as I said, this is, this is going to require reasoning instead of rote. You know, it's, it's just not a document that you can just um, apply without thinking. So the next, uh, actually, you know what, the next section is about why fair use matters to librarians. I actually think Rachel did a fantastic job saying, essentially, fair use matters to you all the time. Uh, and uh, everything you do is affected by fair use. And, you know, fair use matters uh, from the point of view of this conference, I think, because it's a real opportunity for you to advocate for yourself and for your mission. So let's skip on down to slide 23. Um, the Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for Academic and Research Libraries here and after the code, um, which is a, a big mouthful, right? So the code uh, was written based on all of these principles that I've just described. Is everything okay? Okay. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, 24, um, the code was created by librarians, right? I mean, I, I have the pleasure of traveling the country and and talking to you all, and, and, and I get to sort of take a victory lap and, and pretend to take credit, but I really can't take credit. Uh, Peter and, and Pat and I and the folks who uh, worked on this team, we were really just stenographers. I mean, what we did was impose a lot on librarians. We asked 90 librarians from 64 different institutions uh, to join us in these nine small group discussions, and, and for four hours. So we would get someone from 8 o'clock to noon uh, and we would actually would get small groups of eight to twelve people, and work through what we saw, what we had learned from speaking with librarians in an earlier stage of research, were the core challenges that folks are facing right now, and where they could really use fair use uh, to give them some help. And then once we had uh, a consensus around eight principles that I'll walk through with you in a second, we had some uh, legal experts look over it, right, and make sure that. Uh, that this would pass muster, right? And it's not the case because fair use is flexible. Um, I like to say, you know, so fair use is kind of like the afterlife, right? Every lawyer uh, is sort of like a, an amateur theologist that has his own view of what the perfect fair use doctrine should look like. And, uh, and we take a kind of pride of ownership. We don't want anyone else to tell us what fair use is. So, you know, you're never going to get, if you put two, two lawyers in a room, they're going to disagree about fair use to some extent but they don't disagree about what is a reasonably arguable case. And that's what these uh, lawyers said. They said, I would take this case, right? If your use conforms with these, with these principles, I would take that case and represent you. So let's go to the next slide, um, slide 25. So how did we think folks could use this code? Um, and it's really, it is an advocacy document, right? It is an advocacy document. Um, it is meant in part to put uh, legal risks into perspective. Um, and, and the notion that I like to use here is, is mission risk. Uh, so what we found when we spoke with librarians about copyright uh, at the very early stages of this project was that a lot of them wanted to reduce the apparent copyright risk or legal risk to zero before they were comfortable going forward. And 
it really didn't matter how important the project was or the value of it. Um, the, the, the assumption was if you can't reduce legal risk to zero, then that's it, end of project. And part of what the code is meant to do, in addition to primarily reminding you that legal risks are really close to zero in a lot more cases than you think, but was also to get librarians in a room and have them realize that in some sense the, there's a, a risk to the mission that's on the other side of the equation that needs to be considered. That is, what you're doing, if what you're doing is really legitimate and really valuable, socially valuable, and it's going to help your users, it's going to you know, advance teaching, advance scholarship, and so on, to, uh, to forego that use because somebody somewhere might send you a nasty letter about copyright, you know, you should think about whether you really feel, whether you really ought to give, you know, a, a trivial but non-zero level of legal risk that much power over you, right? Or should you advocate for your mission and should you remember why you do what you do um, and factor that into the equation? Another key thing was that a lot of, too many people, frankly, were telling us that, you know, they were never in the room when big decisions about them were made, right? So you would design a policy or come up with a project idea, and you know somewhere along the, the line, someone would say, "Well, let's we better go run that by legal, or we better go run that by you know someone further up a, a food chain somewhere." And when that person decided that it wasn't worth the risk, you weren't there to tell them why it was, and uh, and you weren't there to tell them that frankly the risk is a lot smaller than they realize. And so part of the idea of this document is, you know, to create a thing, right? If you can't be in the room, this thing can be in the room. You know, uh, we a lot of a lot of folks are kind of sliding this document under the door, as it were. You know, making sure that their legal counsel has a copy in his in his hands or her hands, um, so that um, even if the librarian can't speak or isn't allowed to speak uh, as loudly and as clearly as they should. Perhaps collectively, all librarians, you know, via this document could be heard. And then finally, it's a grounding for solidarity. Uh, we couldn't possibly have created, you know, some folks think that this document should, you know, should more accurately reflect the lowest common denominator in the country, right? Um, some folks say, well, there's stuff in here that seems kind of cutting edge, right? Uh, this non consumptive research stuff, this digital humanities stuff. You know, that's not traditional library stuff. That's pretty fresh. Um, how do we know that that's not risky? And uh, when we were speaking with librarians, though, there were over and over again they said, well, the conversation would start with, well, what are you doing now, right? But it would never end there because no one is happy. Uh, no one is totally happy with what they're doing now. And so these discussions that we had would often, um, uh, the consensus would coalesce around a practice that was different from anything anyone was doing. It sort of took the best parts of everybody's uh, policies and then added in some ideal policies that nobody is doing. Um, and these are, in, in that sense, this is a bit of an aspirational document, and it needs you to ratify it, right? It needs librarians to coalesce around it by uh, making it part of their practice. Um, and one of the big problems, in fact, I spoke with a, a librarian who was uh, instrumental in ensuring that this project happened. She was one of the people who spoke with the Mellon Foundation and told them to fund it. She said one of the reasons she wants this project to go forward is that libraries are in these little silos and they don't talk to each other about what they think is good and about what they think is right. And this was a chance to get people in a safe environment where we're, we're doing research, we guarantee them anonymity, and to have conversations where a consensus can emerge without the uh, feeling of scrutiny and pressure that is on your sort of daily practice. So there are, let me go to the next slide, uh, slide 26. So this document describes eight common situations where fair use applies. And it, we're obviously 10 minutes away from the one hour mark. So it would be foolish for me to try and walk through all eight. Um, I do that sometimes when I have time, but that's actually not the point of these talks. Uh, what's, the, doc, the document speaks for itself, um, and, and you guys can have, get it for free online. And actually, I don't know, and we, we're happy to send a box to someone of hard copies and make sure that those hard copies get out to the rest of you 
Um, but the eight common situations, I'll just walk through them very quickly. Um, if you'll go to slide 27. Uh, the first one is about digital access to teaching materials for students and professors. This is really about course reserves, um, e-reserves, and Blackboard, the use of course management sites, things like that. Copying materials and giving them to your students so that they can read them, right? And uh, this, this situation was actually litigated in the Georgia State case. And I'm very proud to say that in many, many ways, the Georgia State outcome, which was favorable for Georgia State, right? They won, you know, 95 out of 99 alleged infringements uh, were not proven to be infringements. Uh, the publishers lost the vast majority of that Georgia State case, and they're appealing. So clearly, they're not happy with how it turned out. Um, they're, not, they're not very appealing, but they are appealing. Um, so, so the principal, the principal, uh, principal one, and it's, a, 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 and it's the limitations that are associated with it, um, are actually pretty closely followed by the Georgia State judge. You know, she gets a couple of things wrong from our perspective, um, but she gets the basic idea that these uses are at the core of fair use. Um, that this is not just course packs. It's really important that it's a library doing it and not Kinko's, right? Libraries, we're not, we're not making a profit and refusing to share the profit. Uh, we are making materials available in a nonprofit setting for educational purposes. So it was a big one for libraries, and I think I consider it to be a vindication of principle one. So uh, in my view, the first principle in the code has a certain um, legal pedigree uh, because of the Georgia State case. So let's skip to slide 29, principle two. So principle two is about exhibits, both the physical and virtual. And again, here the, the core uh, belief of librarians was that when you put together an exhibit, when you uh, curate it, when you make choices about what's going to go into that exhibit, when you describe the material, that that really can be a transformative act. And that you can tell a story from multiple pieces of art or multiple pages from a book, from different books, and so on, that is larger than, that adds value to, that comments on and criticizes any one individual piece in the exhibit. And so when you're making these exhibits to highlight things like special collections um, or to help a researcher or a scholar tell the story of their research using items from your collection, you really can be doing a transformative thing. Let's go to slide 30. Um, this is a really inspirational example. Uh, this is Alexander Gumby's African America. It's, uh, it's a series of notebooks that was kept by a gentleman in, in Harlem uh, during the Harlem Renaissance, right? And he was clipping out uh, poems and op-eds and advertisements and, and little pieces of the culture around him. And he filled uh, many tens of these scrapbooks and he gave the scrapbooks to Columbia University, uh, or his estate gave them to Columbia University. But, of course, he doesn't own any of the stuff that's in the scrapbooks, right? He's not the copyright holder. He just cut and pasted. Um, so, if you're Columbia, you have to wonder if I'm showing this, you know, this poem, uh, and I don't own it, could I get sued by the poet? Um, but it's very clear if you go through and play with this exhibit and look at it that the exhibit tells a story that is larger than and transformative of the constituent parts of the exhibit. So that's a really good example of an exhibit. Um, my time is running short, so let me skip ahead and talk about, now let's go to uh, slide 43. So there are, like, uh, there are six other principles that I didn't get to talk about in detail, but as I said, they're in the book. Um, they're, they're, they're fairly you know, straightforward, but they will also need your attention as you apply them. But I want to talk a little bit about the courts. Um, again, the Georgia State case had a different rationale than the code, right? Um, but largely her, her holdings were congruent with the code. But, and I also want to say that that case is up on appeal right now. So a lot of folks have asked me, should I rely on the Georgia State case instead of the code, or has the Georgia State case replaced the code? Um, and for several reasons, I don't think that's true, even though the case is largely similar to the reasoning that we came to. Um, first of all, it's up on appeal, and everything could change, right? The second, the, the, the 11th Circuit is going to hear this case. Hopefully, things will get better. I think they'll get better. That is, it will become even more favorable to libraries, but they could get worse. And in any event, you don't want to waste your time changing your, your practice, and then in a year, uh, a new decision comes out, and you've got to change it again. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about the Georgia State case as a, as a, as a principle um, to follow right now. 
the other thing is the Georgia State case is only about scholarly books. So if you're interested in using music or video or fiction or essays or journal articles and on and on or images, the Georgia State case doesn't really have much to say to you because it's it's all about how many chapters and whether there's a license available. And that stuff is often not going to even be remotely applicable to the kinds of material that people use other than scholarly books. The next case is a, is a really good news story. It's the author's Guild the Hathi Trust case, which was just decided a couple of weeks ago. And in that case, in my view, uh, three principles in the code were ratified, were absolutely endorsed and ratified and have become, unless there is an appeal and to see what that appeal says, um, those 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 principles are now endorsed in the law. So mass digitization for preservation, principle three, um, which says if you have an item that is, uh, that is becoming obsolete or is becoming uh, or is degrading or otherwise um, needs to be copied in order to be used and saved um, in a reasonable manner, um, the fair use can, can help you there, and the judge agreed. Accessibility. If you have an item that is not available on the market in any kind of accessible form, you can digitize that item so that people who are differently able are able to read it, right? And then finally, non-consumptive use. This is search and, uh, and computer uses of books where you're not really interested in reading one book. What you're doing is searching a corpus of millions of books and asking a question like, you know, when did people stop saying United, the United States are thus and such, uh, the plural form, and when did they switch to saying the United States is as a singular? It turns out, right, Civil War is, that, is when that happened. But that research can be done now on a corpus of millions of books, and you can see that there was a huge change in language uh, based on that political reality. So the, the hockey trust case is largely a vindication for you and for your values and for the value of what you do. And it's a vindication uh, of library advocacy for the value that we add to culture, right? I can tell you because I know the people who wrote the briefs in this case. Um, yes, there were legal arguments that were vitally important. The legal arguments had to be tight. They had to be right. They had to be strong. But there was a narrative. There was a story. Uh, we told the judge, essentially, there is a hugely valuable thing, millions of digital books, that now exist that couldn't have existed if not for this, the creation of this hockey trust. Will you destroy that thing for copyright? Is that what copyright requires, that you take that thing and unplug it and make it useless? Um, that is an absurd outcome. And, and to be able to tell that story, the value of that story, rather than just the legal argument, is hugely important. And, and you need to, as librarians, uh, remember your values and be able to advocate them. So. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, the slide 44. So the in a handy slogan, right, the basic idea here is that practice makes practice. It matters what you do, and what you do now will affect what you do in the future. And all of those things will affect the law. So every decision you're making now and the way that you talk and think and act around these issues of fair use and copyright, um, those things can prevent you from taking action in the future if you choose if you choose poorly, right? Or they can open doors for you in the future. And so, again, it really matters to be thoughtful about these things and to work together. Um, if you'll uh, go to the next slide, there's a lot more information available. And if you go to slide 46, we have a lot of stuff on our website, arl.org slash fair use, um, that you can use to make your case. So we have FAQs, right? When you get the hard questions, um, there are FAQs, not just for librarians, but for faculty and for students about how fair use applies in these common scenarios. Um, there are videos uh, of me giving the much longer version of this talk, for one thing, and of Peter Yazzie uh, joining in and giving the sort of dignified, uh, uh, you know, statesman-like, professorly version of the talk. Um, there are um, there's just lots of resources. We're actually working on some success stories as well. Again, speaking of, of you know talking about libraries and speaking up for libraries, we've got video interviews with a series of library directors that we're editing right now and putting together uh, so that uh, people will see that the code is really making a difference out there. Um, if you'll uh, go ahead to the next slide, this is a book uh, reclaiming fair use that Pat and Peter wrote. 
and it kind of summarizes, well, not summarizes, what I've done in some sense is to summarize this book um, in terms of the movement around fair use and that um, you can read this book and it will actually tell you how to write your own code sort of for any community that you're a part of, how to organize that community and how to think about uh, fair use and how it will apply to that community. Uh, to go to the next slide, this is our handy dandy copyright disclaimer. Uh, share this whole thing, you have our permission, use it, do whatever you want with it, um, and, and uh, sell it even, I don't care. Um, and if you're going to excerpt it, you don't need our permission because fair use will protect you. Um, and then finally, I have to credit uh, on our next slide, 49, I have to credit the, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Their support was absolutely essential. Uh, but more, even more than Mellon, uh, the support of research libraries was vitally, vitally important. Um, we imposed on so many librarians so much um, for so long, and um, it couldn't have, we couldn't possibly have determined, uh, the, made the determinations that we did if um, literally hundreds of hours hadn't been spent by them talking with us and helping, uh, helping us understand what, what they think. So, and then the last slide has my contact info on it. You can bug me anytime, ask me questions, it's fine. I'm happy to talk to any of you anytime. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. I think so. Yeah, I can't hear you. Two-part question. Limitations seem to be a core of best practices. Is that to mitigate effect on the market? And if so, can limitations be bypassed if you can make an argument in favor that the effect on market is negligible? Okay, and let me try and let me rephrase and see if I can rephrase if I get it right. Uh, so. Many of the limitations in, I guess you're talking about in the code, seem to revolve around whether there's a market active and whether there's going to be a real effect on that market. Um, and so, right, if you can point out that there's no market, are you in good shape? Is that, is that right? More is uh, if you can argue that the effect on the market would be negligible. Uh, or, or non-existent, not because the market doesn't exist, but because of other circumstances. Yeah, sure, that can be, so this is interesting. I mean, I talked about transformativeness and the importance of transformativeness. And one of the things that's good and helpful about transformativeness is that if you can show that your use is transformative, courts don't care <laughs> about the market. That is, uh, so the, the paradigm case, uh, the, the Supreme Court case where transformativeness came up was uh, a case where two live crew were sued by Roy Orbison because they took Oh Pretty Woman and made a hip hop song out of it. Um, and the court said, well, it's a parody. They're making fun of Roy Orbison with this song. I don't know if that's true, but we'll, we'll give it to them. There, it's a parody and Roy Orbison, even though uh, Roy Orbison has a market, right? You can pay him. 
and uh, you can pay him to use his music. And in this case, Two Live Crew even tried to pay him, but his price was too high, and so they walked away and just used it without paying. And the court said that's fine. It doesn't matter if there's a market or not. So there's been a real turn to transformativeness because it's very easy to pay people these days, right? It's very easy to set up something like, oh, I don't know, the Copyright Clearance Center, <laughs> where, uh, <laughs> where there's a website and your stuff is listed, and if you want to, you know, somebody can find you on Copyright Clearance Center and they can, they can pay you, and it's it's rather painless, and so there's been a real turn to transformativeness as a way to say, well, even if you make it very easy for me to pay you, I still don't have to pay you. So that's one kind of argument. But it, that doesn't uh, take away the argument that you describe, which is it's, you've made it very hard for me to pay you, or uh, my use doesn't really affect your market. It's, not, it's so small or it's so, um, it's so uh, marginal that you, know, you wouldn't have made any money anyway. Um, that that's that's that is an argument that's available to you. Um, and in fact, people talk a lot about orphan works, and I think there's a really strong argument to be made that you know, look, if you're an orphan, if you've abandoned your work, right? If you've sort of left it at my doorstep, and I'm a library, I get to be a good foster parent, right? I get to do things with your work without having to ask your permission because you're gone. I can't find you anymore, and you're not being responsible, and so I don't have to pay you, and I don't have to ask you because I can't. Um, so that's that's a perfectly valid argument that I think is available to you. Other questions? Okay, this is a question I've struggled with recently. It's course packs. If a professor wants to use journal articles and puts them into a course pack, Traditionally, we've asked permission from the Copyright Clearance Center. Is that necessary that we do that? I didn't catch the very last part. Do we have to pay the Copyright Clearance Center? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the important part. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, if a professor you know, makes like an anthology or something, these are the articles that I want my students to read. We're going to discuss them. We're going to criticize them. Why are we paying? The Copyright Clearance Center for those uses. Yeah, I mean, uh, so in the context of course packs, I think in a lot of cases the reason that people are paying is out of habit, you know, because they've always paid and because there's an infrastructure there to pay. And and if if especially if it's if it is Kinkos or some off-campus copy shop that's that's doing this for profit. Um, then you know they probably are, are should have to pay, and there's good case law on that. Um, and unfortunately, that case law that says if you're an off-campus for-profit copy shop, uh, you should have to be you should have to pay permissions. That case law has been more or less interpreted by most people nowadays to mean that if you're dealing with a paper course pack, you should be paying permission. I don't think that's entirely fair or accurate, but I will tell you that in the code of best practices, we don't talk about paper. Um, the first principle is only about electronic media, and it's only about the library facilitating electronic access rather than paper access. And that was mostly because, again, there is this really firmly entrenched practice of paying for paper course packs. So should we you be know, paying for digital? Electronic? No, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, if you've got, um, and you can look at the, you can look at the principle in the code. Um, but the basic question you're going to want to ask is: Is this material um, being used in the way that it was written to be used, and for the purpose it was written to be used? And and very often the answer is going to be no. So. When you talk about general purpose publications, and if you're talking about like a newspaper, you know, a contemporary op-ed that's being assigned as an example of a certain kind of rhetoric, or, I mean, I, I, you know, you could go on. The imagination is unlimited here. There are all sorts of educational uses where something that was written in order to persuade is used instead to illustrate a certain method of persuasion, or if something that was uh, written in order to, you know, to um, 
To make a certain point is instead used as an example of a popular idea from a certain historical era. So basically, if your faculty can tell you, you know, look, this is not educational material. This material is made for some other purpose, and I'm making it the object of criticism and, com and commentary in my class. Then you've got a strong transformative story to tell. And then you're going to want to ask them, how much do you need to do what you want to do? You know, if all you need is, you know, the thesis, you know, in the first few paragraphs, then you don't, don't take the whole thing. You know, if you're talking about a, a journal article or something, if you don't really need them to read the whole article, if the point is just to see that, you know, some people used to think a certain way, you can, you know, cut it off at a certain point once the point is, comes across. So what you're going to want to talk to your faculty about is, you know, how is what you're doing different from the original purpose of the thing? And if it's different, how is the amount that you're asking me to make available the appropriate amount given the purpose of your, of your use? And then there's some other important stuff in here, right, uh, in, the, in the code. I mean, you sh you're going to want to limit access to students that are enrolled in the class. Uh, you're going to want to revoke that access when the class is over or some appropriate amount of time thereafter to allow people to finish assignments and whatnot. Um, so there are all sorts of safeguards that you want to take to make sure that you're within the bounds of that, um, you know, again, not taking more than you need and making more available than is appropriate. But given that the purpose is new and different, then you'll have a, a transformative argument. Thank you so much. I think we have to, we have no more time for questions, sadly, um, so our schedule doesn't go too far off the rails. But um, thank you so much, Brandon, and thank you for putting up with the, the technology issues so gracefully. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks again. We'll let you uh, get on with your evening. <laughs> I have it. Okay. So, boy, there's so much stuff I want to say, and I'm not going to say any of it because <laughs> we promised to give you guys time to talk. Um, I, Anne Marie said she was not a detail oriented person, and when she said it to me, I said, Yeah, God, I'm not either. And uh, I didn't notice through folding a hundred of these chickadee uh, <laughs> handouts that I was missing principle number five until somebody pointed it out to me in the middle of this presentation. So number five is um, making use of materials for print disabled users. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's a very important principle. Um, so now what we're gonna do is the part of this that gives my control freak uh, nature a little bit of a heart attack because we're gonna have like a little bit of chaos right now. But uh, because we're gonna try to break into the small groups um, within the confines of this building. So the way that's gonna work, right, is um, we've got um, eight facilitators for your small group discussions and they have been assigned a place to bring a group. <laughs> um, so they will bring your group of around 10 they all know how many people they can fit in their place. <laughs> um, they'll bring you there to have your conversation, right? And they've got the kind of um, guidelines for how these conversations are gonna go. I've provided a certain amount of structure which you can use or throw out as you see fit. Basically, our goal here is to answer that question, how does this document help us actually put into practice in our, in our institutions new policies, what's left for us to do. This, this is you know, a, a, a framework for solidarity, right? Once we have that solidarity, what do we do with it? Those kinds of questions, right? And, and the questions you'll pose yourselves. So um, we're not gonna do like a long reporting out afterwards. I'm gonna come around and collect all of your comments um, and we'll have a Google document that'll be made available to everybody that'll summarize all of this stuff so that we don't spend time on that reporting out. Um, so the facilitators will be at the back of the room and they're gonna kind of grab groups of you and take you places. <laughs> um, and we'll just hope that this works, right? <laughs> so thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for putting up with the technology uh, problems so gracefully as well. And um, thanks to Jim <laughs> for making that happen. <laughs> And your facilitators will have copies of the code, the full, co the full code, um, and other stuff as well. 
and we'll see you back here.